Well, in the band, I, I was, we were with everybody. We played with, we played with everybody or shared dressing rooms with everybody, but you know, the Beatles, the Stones, the Who, Hendrix, Dylan, but you know, you name just about anybody else from there on down and we hung out with them. Everybody hung out with everybody else. I went, gosh, nobody's happy. Nobody has real fulfillment. You noticed it. Yeah. The more I went into my hermitage, into solitude, the more the records just exploded. So I was breaking the mold of what the record company says is what you ought to be doing. Namely, the more you go out there and tour, the more records you're going to sell. They wanted their artists on the road like 150 concerts a year, which is what everybody else was doing. And I was staying at doing home the opposite. In the <laughs> and doing like 10 concerts a year, maybe. And so the more I went into solitude, the more my records sold. And I outsold everybody. People don't remember this because I outsold Keith Green. I outsold the second chapter of Axe. I outsold everybody because I wasn't trying to sell records. I was trying to pray. That's all I was trying to do. What else with Corey, man? This guy can podcast like nobody can. What else with Corey, man? You will look deep inside of yourself and feel something you've never felt when he asked what else. What else with Corey, man? John Michael Talbot, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you. It's good to see you. I'll give you a heads up. I'm getting over the flu, so I don't I don't feel particularly well. But oh, John, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're going to get over this because tomorrow I have four of these. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like the appetizer plate for tomorrow's feast. Yeah. What's your name? I, I forgive me. I'm sorry. I'm Corey. Let's start off with this: three things that we don't know about John Michael Talbot that you're willing to reveal. Three things. Well. The first is, uh, I have the flu. One, I like Gunsmoke. The TV show, okay. Yeah, but only only when they kept Chester. The second guy was really good, but I really liked Chester. That's number two. It's not fun when a show removes one of your favorite characters and then continues yeah. the show. Yeah. I thought those early seasons were really fun and i like the old black and white westerns let's see what would be another thing that people don't know about me you know i've had biographies written about me and autobiographies i i just did an autobiography so i revealed a lot in there when i was sick which i am today and my mother has passed away and my mother would come down and she would take her little hand like this and she would pat right here, and she'd go, oh, Johnny, I wish you were better, right on the side of my cheek. People don't know that. So those are three things people don't know. But now you know. Now that you are currently under the weather, which, by the way, you're a trooper for continuing to do this, do you miss Mother's Hand as you are under the weather today? Always. I always think about it when I'm, when I'm on my back, laying there, feeling terrible. She would come down and she would just go, oh, Johnny, I wish you were better. I, when I see you sick, I just don't feel good either. You just gave me a great segue into one of my favorite questions, John, that I like to ask people because it reveals a lot about the person, the way they talk about their parents. So I'll set hmm. you up. Who's mom and dad? My dad, Dick Talbot, and my mother. Her name back then when they were married was Jimmy Margaret. As you might imagine, my grandfather was James Cochran, and he was a preacher, a, a circuit writer around western, or excuse me, eastern Oklahoma and western Arkansas. Thought he was going to have a boy, and he didn't. So he named her Jimmy, J I M M I E, Margaret. And then, of course, my mother, when she got older and older, she changed it to Jamie to try to make it a little bit more feminine, anyway. I had really great parents. My dad, they married late, actually. They were just solid as a rock, World War II parents. 
My dad went off and fought in World War II, was part of the Army Air Force, flew the hump into Burma on a B-24 Liberator, which is, uh, you know, that's a dangerous run. It was one of the most dangerous runs in the war. You don't hear a lot about it, but for guys that remember that was a dangerous run, he'd come back and there'd be ack ack holes all over the plane, and they'd all just look at the plane and go, how did we survive? It just so happened that they weren't in that part of the plane when the shrapnel went through that part of the plane because they were moving around. My mother was a preacher's kid. Consequently, when we were raised, we were not raised with religion shoved down our throats. We went to church, but we went to church usually on an average, I would say, three times out of the, out of the month. We weren't force-fed. We didn't have to go to church every Sunday. And there were advantages to that and disadvantages to that. John, did Dad openly talk about World War II? Yeah, he had, he had things that he brought back, you know, from India. He had his, his army stuff. He had his big knife. And he had his flight jacket. Uh, stuff that they were re- required to carry with them. And he brought all that stuff back. He brought gifts back for mom, you know, some nice ones. And we would ask about all that stuff and ask about World War II. He met Gandhi. He met Lord Mountbatten, who was the supreme commander of the Allied forces. He kind of had his, you know, he was a, he was a boy from uh, Lawton, Oklahoma, and he had his vision expanded. So he was always a solid Christian, but he had his vision as a solid Christian really expanded regarding culture and other religions. Every guy in the unit had a houseboy, and they were required to. And the houseboy was a Hindu who was a Christian secretly, but he couldn't convert because if he converted, the caste system would cast him out, basically. Sure. You know, he just learned a lot of things about another culture that he didn't know, you know, you wouldn't even think of in Lawton, Oklahoma. My dad, I I write about these things in my my new autobiography, Late of I Loved You, uh, about my my dad. And he had a a profound effect on me by saying very little about God, but what he said about God, he had, he would talk about how big God was. I'd say, What's God like? And he'd say, you know, well, son, he's he's very, very big, very, very big. And I'd be laying on the, you know, the seat of our Dodge Dart, going with him to some sales meeting in northern Indiana and looking up at the stars, you know. When we were in Oklahoma, we'd be out in the backyard, you know, looking up at the stars usually again. And, and I had this concept that if there are molecules and stuff inside of our bodies, and if a solar system is like a molecule, what if that just goes on endlessly, and we are part of God's body, and, and so on and so forth? And he said, that's very interesting, son. Keep thinking like that. God is very, very big, very, very big. You know, he just he had a, a profound effect on me. Is Oklahoma where it all started, John? Yeah, I was born in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Then we lived briefly in Little Rock, Oklahoma, and then I went to Indianapolis, Indiana. Then uh, our band got together. We got involved in music in Indianapolis, won the Battle of the Bands contest after folk music, and got a record contract in Chicago. Then did some country rock music with Mason Prophet. I listened to Mason Prophet for the first time today. I love music, John. I try to be well-rounded in music world. That was my first listen, and I chose uh, Two Hangmen. Two Hangmen was the, it was the hit that would have put us over the top, but the FCC banned it from the airwaves. Yeah, the the FCC considered it to be an anti-war protest song. Okay. Which it wasn't. It wasn't. What led you to Indianapolis? Was it buddies? Was it the family had jobs? What was it? My dad got a job there. So we moved to uh, Indianapolis. We kept making music. We threw a band together from people that we met on the north side of Indianapolis in Broad Ripple. 
there was a music store there where people tended to congregate. I don't remember the name of the music store. Again, there was a Battle of the Bands contest. We won it and got a record contract with Bill Trout, who had produced a lot of hit records. I was 12, 12 years old. Wow. Then, then we just went around as kind of a regional band. That kind of bottomed out after a few years. And when I was 15, Bill Trout, again, the same record producer, said, uh, gee, there's this new thing happening in California called Country Rock. And so he says, why don't you guys try it? And I had studied bluegrass banjo under a uh, guy who had studied under a national champion. We tried uh, country rock and we went in and did a demo and he said, hey, this thing sounds so good. Let's just make it, make it an album. And then he went around and tried to sell it. And we ended up on some tiny little label. I think it was, it was called Happy Tiger Records. And we did two records with them, and then it was picked up by, I think we were picked up by Ampex, and then we were picked up by Warner Brothers, and we ended up on Warner's with Joe Smith. We we were one of those bands that was, everybody thought we were going to be the next super group, because Terry had absolute charisma on stage. And Terry's your brother. Had, yeah, my older brother. We had all the makings of a super group. We never had a hit. We never had a hit. Jerry Weintraub, who was the, you know, John Denver's manager. I think he helped Frank Sinatra when he did his comeback. And he helped with Elvis when he did his comeback thing. He, he's, he's a big name. He did Ocean's Eleven and all the Ocean's movies. He wanted to manage us. And he met with Terry and he said, look, and Joe Smith with Warners was in on this. He says, you and John stay together and let us put together the very best band. Whatever the best players you want, we'll put them together. And you write half the songs and let us get the other half the songs. It'll be absolute hits. And you will be the biggest thing in music. Terry was a phenomenon on stage. He just had absolute charisma. And Terry said no. I was not in on that meeting. I was too young. And I was living on a farm back in Indiana. He stayed loyal to his bandmates, you know. All the bandmates were guys we had gone to school with. So, and it was probably the reason that we never made it. So that's that. You can read about this in my uh, in my autobiography, really. Let's talk about Call Jesus, me. John. Let's talk about Jesus. When does he enter the picture? You started playing guitar when you were super young. You've, you're doing this band, and it's not quite panning out. But when does Jesus cross paths with John Michael? Well, in the band, I, I was we were with everybody. We played with we played with everybody or shared dressing rooms with everybody, but you know, the Beatles, the Stones, the Who, Hendrix, Dylan, you know, you name just about anybody else from there on down, and we hung out with them. Everybody hung out with everybody else. I went, gosh, nobody's happy. Nobody has real fulfillment. You noticed it. Yeah. And then one day I looked out over a, you know, a big field house where we had done a concert. And we were doing the loadout. And one of the guys working up top, the rigging slipped and he fell, landed flat on his back and he died. Right there in front of us. And I, and I went, wow, I don't want people. To, and there was just, there was alcohol bottles and drug paraphernalia everywhere. And I said, this is not what I want to do. I don't want people dying for this. So I began a search and I started looking through world religions. So I read about Hinduism and Buddhism and Taoism and Sufism and Islam and the Essenes and Judaism and Greek philosophy. And at the same time, I was reading my Bible that my grandmother had given me. And the red letters were jumping out because Jesus seemed to say so much more by saying a whole lot less. And Jesus was, he just said it all in just a few words. And plus, nobody died and rose. You know, nobody else did that. But I didn't have a personal experience with Jesus. So finally, I began praying, who are you? God, a he, a she, or an it. I don't care. I 
I just want to know. And I had, I had an encounter with Christ. He uh, appeared to me in a hotel room somewhere in the Midwest. People say, oh, that's your imagination. I go, well, it might have been. You know, God gave me an imagination. He can work through it. You know, I, I don't know what it was. All I know is it was. It was enough to convert me to begin calling myself a Christian because I had been raised a Christian, but I had totally fallen away from the faith. And this brought me back to where I said, I'm a Christian. I didn't know anything really about Christianity because even though I'd been raised in it, I didn't pay any attention to it. This brought me back. I began reading scripture and reading everything I could possibly read about Jesus. Uh, that was in 1971, and it was a pivot point in my life. I was with all these really good people, and they, are, they were all good people, and they all had the Holy Spirit. I didn't doubt that. But they weren't able to fellowship together. They seemed to just be continuously dividing, uh, starting a new church because they didn't like this, that, or the other about one another. Gosh, we see it over in our little town here next to our monastery in Berryville. They continue to start new churches. You know, they don't like Pastor Chuck, so they start another church, you know. And then they don't like Pastor Joe, so they start a new church. It just goes on and on and on. That troubles me. And I said, this is not what Jesus wants. Diversity, yes. But division, no. So what did the early church have? So I said, I got to start reading about the early church. And I went back and I started reading what are called the Apostolic Fathers, which would be Ignatius of Antioch, Clement of Rome, a writing called The Teaching of the Twelve Apostles or the Didache, and these are all writings that are, they existed in the same period as, for instance, when John was writing the Apocalypse or the Revelation. And I began to see that there were things in there that are very, very Catholic. Things like apostolic succession, that they believed very strongly that the bishop held the church together, the episcopus in Greek, and that we trace our unity through the succession of bishops. Well, we keep the church together because this bishop was the successor to this bishop who was a successor to the apostles. Yeah, we're going to stay with him. Even though this bishop may be young, he may be inexperienced, maybe we don't even like him, but we're going to stay with this bishop. And some people don't want to stay with this bishop. We're going to stay with this bishop because if we start just fracturing, then we're going to split all over the place. We're going to stay with him. And the teachings were all there. They believed in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, that it was the body and blood of Christ. And there was a reason for that in, the, in Ignatius of Antioch. That he was speaking against the Docetists. The Docetists didn't believe that Jesus had a real body, that he only seemed to have a real body. So they separated from the Orthodox Christians, who in the celebration of the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, Basically, in that celebration, they were saying, no, this is the body and blood of Jesus. Jesus really had a body and blood, and this continues in the sacrament. There were reasons for all this stuff in the early church, and on and on. So I, I found the seeds of what we call the Catholic Church in those early church fathers. It's very, very clear. And I went, whoa, well, this is a surprise, because I wasn't expecting to find that at all. <laughs> you know, I also was looking for uh, something more mystical and something more contemplative. I found that in the monastic, the monastic part of the church. So you have St. Anthony of the Desert and those who followed his tradition, both in northern Africa, and in the southern part of continental Europe as it spread north, and in Asia Minor as it went east. And that became the contemplative beating heart of the church, this monastic contemplative beating heart. And I went, whoa, well, I don't see anything like that. You know, in essentially, they call it the non-denominational church, but it's it's a 
it's a growth from the Protestant church. And I was looking for something that would cure the disunity. And I was also looking for something that was more mystical and more contemplative. And I found that. So I became a Catholic in 1978. The Lord gave me a word and he said, John, she's my first church. She's been sick and nearly died, but I want to heal her and raise her to new life again. And I want you to be part of her. So I became a Catholic in 78. And I put out a record called The Lord's Supper and followed that with Come to the Quiet. My brother and I did a record called The Painter. Then I did For the Bride and Troubadour of the Great King. The more I went into my hermitage, into solitude, the more the records just exploded. So I was breaking the mold of what the record company says is what you ought to be doing. Namely, the more you go out there and tour, the more records you're going to sell. They wanted their artists on the road like 150 concerts a year, which is what everybody else was doing. And, and I was staying at doing home the in the <laughs> and doing like 10 concerts a year, maybe. And so the more I went into solitude, the more my records sold. And I outsold everybody. People don't remember this because I outsold Keith Green. I outsold the second chapter of Acts. I outsold everybody because I wasn't trying to sell records. I was trying to pray. That's all I was trying to do. It was a phenomenon of the spirit. When you're in the spirit, you can't stop those things. And that just went on and on and on. And it went on for two decades you mentioned the monastery that you're at now. How long have you been at that monastery? Been here since uh, the community's existed since 79. We've been here since 1983. And we're called the Brothers and Sisters of Charity. We're an integrated mon monastery. We're the only one of our kind in the United States. There's about 10 like ours in the Catholic Church. We integrate states of life and we integrate spirituality. So we have traditional monks singles, families, men and women, each living in their own places, and also spirituality. So it would be Franciscan, Benedictine, the East, the West, contemplative, charismatic, liturgical, spontaneous, so on and so forth. It's totally unique in the United States. I would invite people to come and visit us. We have a, a retreat ministry Come make one of our retreats. And if you can't do that, just come and stay for a few days. You would be welcome. And it's an absolutely beautiful place. It's one of the undiscovered gems of the United States here in the Ozark Mountains. We also have a domestic community who live in their own homes all around the country in six different regions. It's a way to be part of our community without becoming one of the monastic members. Okay. And you can join and if you want to be a monk, you can join us. And if you and if you can't do either, you can eat like a monk by getting our bakery products. We have a great bakery, and we have Viola's granola and St. Clair's breakfast cookies, our hermit bars, and there's variations of all those things. And we have sales going on all the time. It's one of the ways that we support ourselves. So that bakery is very, very important. And, of course, I have my... My products out there, I have the new biography, or excuse me, it's an autobiography. It's the first time I've written an autobiography called Late If I Loved You and an EP. It's about 30 minutes of music. Uh, I like it a lot. Same title, Late If I Loved You. It's based on an experience I had in the hospital in Houston about seven years ago where the Lord let me see paradise. And he took me to the other side. I came back. I saw all my sins and all of God's forgiveness all in one lash. And it left me speechless where all I could do was weep when I prayed. And I'm still kind of in that space right now. This record is trying to capture that in sound. I'm fascinated with the menu. Is there a website where you sell that stuff or you only sell it at the monastery? No, go to, go to littleportionbakery.org. And uh, you can you can also go to uh, brothers and sisters of charity dot org about our community, and you can go to John Michael dot com to find out about moi. 
Your, your, your resume of books and uh, albums and musical works is pretty lengthy, and you did just mention your newest stuff. But, John, if you would, pick one album, pick one book to encourage us to go, hey, go check this out. I would choose the last one I did because there's just too many, and, and uh, I always choose the last one I, I finished. You know what people really like is The Lessons of St. Francis. Yeah. That was a best-selling book. I wrote it with Steve Raby. He's an evangelical. It kind of crosses the divide between evangelical and Catholic in bringing Francis to people. John com for any of the information that he passed along. John, I hope you feel better. I know you got a full day tomorrow, but I appreciate the time you gave me today. You're a trooper. Thank you, buddy. And thank you. You're, you're a great interviewer. What else with Corey Mann? With your host, Corey Mann. Original music and theme song by Chris Cron. Share this episode with a friend. And thanks for listening.